And good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the stream tonight. This is To The Point. My name is Mark Heim. With me tonight is Dr. Chris Reber, more informally Chris. Uh, Chris is the uh, executive director, the executive dean mm -hmm. at Venango College in Oil City. And Venango College is a new name that everyone is getting used to. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, uh, an incredibly exciting development. Uh, we recently celebrated our 50th anniversary. And in fact, it was a year long celebration that just concluded. And uh, we're the oldest regional campus in Pennsylvania state system of higher education. The campus has been growing, as you well know, Mark. Uh, over the last 10 years, our enrollment has doubled. And that's really a, a, a tribute to so many people, community, uh, faculty, staff, students, alumni. We've been gra gradually adding programs. We also have been adding um, what I would call qualitative measures. Our programs are uh, now all nationally accredited. Um, and kind of all that came together as we were celebrating our 50th anniversary. Uh, our president, Dr. Karen Whitney, uh, asked me if I thought this was a good time for us to consider becoming Clarion's fourth college. Clarion is actually organized into three colleges. Mm -hmm. We were a campus. And so we spent a year engaging the university community and the surrounding community in whether that would make sense. It ultimately uh, was determined to, to have made a lot of sense. And it's a tribute to not only the, the qualitative growth, the quantitative growth, the growth in enrollment and programs, but the qualitative growth, the quality of what we're doing, um, the kind of precision focus in terms of what we're doing. And so it's really a testament to the the evolution of the campus. We've reached a milestone. Uh, so it has great significance internally within the state system. When you're a college, you you have, frankly, more authority mm -hmm. and, uh, to, to kind of chart your own course. It also has significance for us externally because we've been doing more and more in terms of program development, uh, always doing things that matter for the community. But the things we're doing also happen to meet high priority workforce needs statewide and even nationally. So we know there is a growing population of prospective students from outside the region and it's a lot uh, there's more gravitas mm -hmm. uh, when you promote yourself as a college uh, than a campus so so it's much more than a name change it's more than a name change it really signifies uh, very concrete uh, growth and outcomes let's talk about some of those qualitative changes uh, some of the things that I have observed since I moved into the area and began to talk with you a number of years ago is the growth in the number of academic programs. Right. How and why has that happened? Well, uh, for years, frankly, the Venango campus struggled. It was a branch campus of Clarion, and it was a place where, frankly, you normally wound up if uh, you were not admissible to the Clarion campus, or uh, if you just really wanted to be very, very close to home. But as, as a result, uh, for many years, uh, the university didn't invest in the campus mm. uh, in a way that would have, would have really allowed it to reach its potential. That all turned around with, uh, I think, some visionaries who saw the potential. And those include our former president, Dr. Joe Grunenwald, mm -hmm. and certainly our advisory board of community leaders, who really felt that this campus could be not only successful, but it could be a center of excellence. Uh, in the delivery of a very distinctive mission. And so we began to look at Venango totally differently. This all predates me. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at it as a place that would offer distinctive programs, not a second choice location, distinctive programs. Uh, and as we started to do that, and we started to develop programs that meet two key litmus tests, high priority needs in the community have to be met by the program, has to be something we can do well. Uh, as, as that became the focus and we started to add programs that really mattered for the community, now students were seeking the campus uh, because of what it offered, because of the special distinctive programming. And that really kind of turned it all around. And so uh, traditionally we've uh, been a campus that's offered one and two year programs. That continues to be the largest part of our business, but we are now selectively adding bachelor's and even graduate degrees. Mm -hmm and uh, are in the process of building what we call a career and educational ladder. And the idea there is you have steps on the ladder and uh, any student can come in at the appropriate step. If you've never had any higher education, 
you might come in initially seeking a certificate program and then can go up the ladder uh, to an associate degree, a bachelor's degree, even a graduate degree. Stopping in and stopping out as you need to, going part-time or full-time. A lot of our programs are uh, offer, are offered online mm-hmm. so that you can, uh, you can make educational progress around family and work responsibilities. Those have been the ingredients that have really, I think, allowed the campus to grow. Now, speaking of the ingredients, one of the things that I've noticed also uh, that's been key to a lot of students' decisions to attend Venango College has been the fact that the college remains small enough yes. for a great deal of personal attention Absolutely. in just about every area. Um, in my own experience, uh, my son uh, took classes there for a year or so before he enlisted into the military, and the one thing that he really liked was the fact that there was a real homey feeling to that. Right. Uh, do you find that other students are conveying that to you? Absolutely. That is certainly one of the things that uh, that we value and that we think uh, uh, it's a thing that's very distinctive about the campus. We have grown, but we're still small. We have a total uh, enrollment of about 1,000 students, and that includes students who are off campus. We, uh, we have some unique partnership programs that wind up taking students at some points in their academic careers to other institutions that we're partnered mm-hmm. with. We have some online programs. So all told, it's a 1,000 students. What that means is every student uh, is known on a first-name basis by his or her faculty. Our faculty are all um, very accomplished. Uh, vast majority have doctorates. And uh, so we think that this combination of high-quality programs caring faculty that have chosen to be on a small campus, which means they value mm-hmm. a lot of student contact. And the ability of the student to, to really be known. We don't have graduate teaching assistants. Mm-hmm. We have relatively small classes. And uh, that, that's powerful. The other, the other, I think, distinctive ingredient that can really enrich the experience at Benango is about half our students are of traditional age. They come mm-hmm. to us from high school. But half are non-traditional. Uh, students who are raising families, are involved in careers, have come back to school after having been away for a long time, or have, who come back as returning adults, mm-hmm. having never uh, go, <clears throat> gone on to, to college. That mixture of uh, traditional and non-traditional students in the classroom is, is very powerful. They, uh, these, these groups of students tend to challenge and support one another in different ways. So, you know, not to be too stereotypical, but uh, our younger students are tech savvy, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, obviously, are uh, are interested in current uh, kind of culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, our older students bring real life experience into the classroom, but they are also inspirational because um, so many of our students are doing so many things, raising families, uh, working full time in many cases, and continuing on. And it's not uncommon for us to have uh, a parent and a and a child. Both attending. That's a rather unique together. experience, I yes, would think. Very. And so I think I think that combination of diversity of students in the classroom, caring faculty, and personal attention uh, it, it is really quite powerful. Something else that I've noticed uh, over time is, and you mentioned reviewing some of the history of Venango College, uh, one of the strongest programs over time has been uh, the programs that I guess have evolved into the allied health field. Yes. And that's been sort of a backbone. Yes. But it's much more than that now, isn't yes. it? Yes. Let me speak to that first. That, that, the, the, the oldest program on our campus and the largest is nursing. Uh, this goes back to the 60s when the Oil City Hospital School of Nursing asked the campus to become mm-hmm. a partner. And uh, today, this surprises some folks, um, the School of Nursing and Allied Health, which is which has its academic home at Venango College in Oil City, um, has the largest enrollment of nursing and allied health students of the 14 public universities in Pennsylvania. That's impressive. The 14 universities that comprise the state system. In, at all levels, we have about 600 students pursuing a nursing or allied health degree. Now, we, are, we now have quite a ladder mm-hmm. of nursing and allied health programs, an associate degree in nursing, we have a bachelor's degree completion program, so you earn the associate degree, become an RN, usually work mm-hmm. uh, by choice, and can continue on to earn the bachelor's 
which is entirely online in the junior senior year. So it's it's a degree completion program wow. that allows a student to get a job, continue on to the bachelor's level around family and work responsibility. So we offer the associate, the bachelor's, we offer a master's of science in nursing uh, in partnership with Edinburgh University. It's a joint degree, it's mm-hmm. a joint Clarion Edinburgh master of science in nursing program with tra- nurse practitioner and nurse educator tracks. We're working on a doctor of nursing practice degree which would be Clarion's first doctoral degree. Wow. That has uh, already been approved throughout our curricular process and now needs to go to Harrisburg for review and hopefully approval. Then in the allied health area, a whole variety of things, associate degree in respiratory care, an associate degree in allied health that's a partnership program. So we partner with allied health organizations that do things like paramedic technology, radiologic technology, ultrasound, that forms a technical concentration within the Clarion University associate degree. We offer a bachelor's in medical imaging sciences, two years at Clarion, two years in an affiliated hospital-based program. You earn a four-year degree from Clarion. And then we've just started a new Bachelor of Science in Allied Health Leadership degree, built the same way as the BSN. So if you've done our respiratory care associate degree or allied health degree, you can go on after getting a job and, and do the junior and senior year online. There's a core of business courses in that program, so it prepares a practitioner who has a technical expertise to go on and seek careers in healthcare administration sales. Uh, that core of business courses then can be a springboard for an MBA. So it, there's this ladder approach mm-hmm. that allows someone to progress not only in terms of educational degree attainment, but obviously in terms of career. Uh, mobility, uh, moving from technical positions to management and leadership positions. So that that whole umbrella of programs in nursing and allied health is absolutely the, the biggest piece. But we have, as you've indicated, been growing in other parts of the curriculum, and, and a very notable one is our applied technology program. Uh, in fact, former Congressman John Peterson um, had uh, provided leadership this Time's flying. This is mm-hmm. 10 years ago or so. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, was uh, what had a vision for community agencies coming together and working together rather than having disparate things mm-hmm. happening here and there. Well, the same is true for education. Uh, we decided that we wanted to have a partnership approach whereby we wanted to do things that were d- distinctive in the region. We're not seeking to try to do things that are offered by right. others. But at the same time, we wanted to come together with other institutions so that we could offer students more. Traditionally, in higher education, uh, the approach has been if there's a need the univer- and the university decides to pursue it, the university develops the program that often requires two or three years of curricular review. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the university invests in the faculty and the equipment, and in order to make it financially viable, there has to be a critical mass of enrollment. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's fine if you have all the pieces, including the critical mass of enrollment. But in rural areas like ours, you have a wide range of need, but you don't necessarily have large numbers of students in any particular area. And so that traditional model has often not worked. Mm-hmm. Um, what we decided to do is, following the congressman's vision, uh, come together with other educational partners so that we could bring their faculty, their expertise, their core business, their facilities into our programs. So in the case of applied technology, uh, we developed a new department and uh, a new academic department, and we um, developed what I would call an umbrella degree. It's an Associate of Applied Science in Industrial Technology, an AASIT. This is a 60-credit program, 30 credits, or our core business. We offer uh, arts and sciences, general education courses, business courses, uh, math, the general education part of the curriculum. We then partner with accredited, licensed, certified, or otherwise approved technical education partners. Mm-hmm. Uh, partners like Precision Manufacturing Institute, PMI in Meadville, that has state-of-the-art um, uh, machining equipment uh, that they use for instructional use, and a faculty that are experienced in industry. Uh, The uh, National Hardwood Lumber Association in Memphis, Tennessee, 
that is the headquarters worldwide for lumber grading certification. You go to Memphis, you do an 18-week program to get great uh, lumber grading certification, which has all kinds of opportunities associated with it. Not uh, insignificant for our region, mm -hmm. where lumber is so important. Uh, it, Triangle Tech, which offers a number of campuses uh, in the trades areas throughout western and central Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a computer services technology organization, First Energy, in the case of uh, electric utility technology. So these partners, uh, we, we, we have affiliation agreements and business agreements with them. They provide 30 credits of instruction in their existing programs. They're already doing this for various reasons. We accept those credits into our Clarion University degree, and uh, our students in this umbrella degree then earn technical concentrations provided by our partner organizations. So in the case of industrial technology, I think we have six or seven technical partners. Collectively, they offer some 30 concentrations within a single degree program that we offer. Um, it, it, it's a breakthrough concept for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, financially, these are existing organizations that have the equipment, the expertise, they're doing this training. We don't have to replicate that. Uh, we wouldn't be able to and, and, and make it financially viable. It gives our students opportunities. Because we're offering a university degree, if students qualify for federal financial aid, that aid is transferred to the partner organization for their part of the program. That helps their viability. Uh, it's a win-win. We're bringing enrollment to partner organizations. They're bringing concentrations and opportunities to our students. And um, it's, uh, it has allowed us also to respond quickly to needs. I'll, one quick example, two years ago, three years ago, there were a number of uh, layoffs in Elk County, St. Mary's and Ridgeway. And uh, there, were, there were workers that had solid salaries, years of service, all of a sudden found themselves out of a job. We were able to go in there in about two months and take our degree program into those communities. Partnered with Precision Manufacturing Institute, PMI came with us. We offered the technical training in Ridgeway in the iTech Center and we offered our general education programs in St. Mary's um, Community Education Council Center. Yes, I recall. And we, the uh, dislocated workers, had what's called TAA funding, Federal Department of Labor funding. Mm -hmm. They had all of their degree program paid for. Uh, it was life-changing. We were able to respond to a particular need quickly. Those students completed this associate degree and got jobs. Uh, and this was outside the immediate Venango area. This too. was we relocated. We put our faculty on the ground there, and th but the really significant thing is this umbrella degree has been fully approved by our curricular uh, committee through our curricular process, which means we can add technical partnerships as long as they meet certifiable, um, externally validated credential standards. In other words, we're not partnering with Joe's Garage. Mm -hmm. We're partnering with an institution that has a specific accreditation that demonstrates their expertise, that it's college level. Uh, we can add partnerships without going back and having uh, the curricular process that can take a year or more. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to go back wheel. to that, yeah. reinvent the wheel. So we can, we can respond to a need uh, by finding a partner that can provide the technical piece of that need, and we can very quickly uh, provide a new program, a new concentration within our program at Venango, online, in other locations. And this it's collaborative dynamic. workforce or development is basically what it is, is workforce development. Absolutely, workforce development. Everything we do uh, in that program meets a high priority workforce need as defined by the Workforce Investment Board. So uh, we, can, we can educate what I call the onesies and twosies. You've got two students that want precision machining, one student that wants lumber grading, etc. They're, they're populating our existing general education course sections. So they're, they're simply adding to our enrollment in existing pro sections we already offer. And the same for our partnership organization. They are being integrated into existing technical courses. It's a win-win. Uh, it's, uh, we can, so we can uh, respond to a wide range of need. Um, one of the most interesting examples in that program that, that you're well aware of is our partnership with uh, First Energy Corporation, yes. Penelac, the parent company of Penelac. Probably the most visible, too. Very visible. Uh, for years, the uh, electric utilities nationwide 
have been lamenting a loss of their workforce. This is hard work, um, you know, line work. Right. Literally climbing poles, being out in in awful weather conditions and dealing with emergencies. Uh, it requires physical dexterity, it, which is why people can't do it for a lifetime. Right. But it also requires an increasingly uh, significant technical expertise that the technology has become more and more complicated. Mm. Uh, their workforce was aging, certainly for Penelac, and they were needing um, they were needing to recruit and educate uh, line workers. This is something they had always done in in house, uh, but they decided at precisely the time we were developing our new partnership model. They, as a corporation, were looking to partner with a university because they wanted their line workers not only to have the technical expertise that they provide, that they train, but they wanted them to have a university degree because increasingly line workers need to be problem solvers, need Mm -hmm. to be able to communicate. It was a marriage made in heaven. We came right together, and for a number of years, Penelec literally uh, paid the full ride for every student in the program. And they would determine each year how many students we were going to recruit into this program. It was all a function of how many line workers they needed. Right. If you were rec- if you were ultimately admitted, uh, you had uh, 100% of your educational costs paid for, you earned an associate degree, and a guaranteed job with Penelac, starting at 60000 in salary plus full benefits. And within three years, you became a journeyman and were earning with uh, mandatory overtime over $100,000 with an associate degree. Now, <laughs> mo- for the moment, um, this panel is not recruiting more folks because with the downturn of the economy, right. uh, they're not seeing the retirements. Uh, but this will certainly come back again, and those students have been incredibly successful. We've educated a bunch of line workers in western Pennsylvania. That's excellent. This mm-hmm. collaborative process is something that's bled over into the uh, you, the college's relationship with the community. And when we come back from our break, I'd like to talk about uh, how the uh, college has become such a good neighbor to not only Oil City, but to Venango County and areas beyond. We'll be back in just a moment. In the crease or at the plate, offsides are on the line. Down at the one or up by two. Catch all the action with Armstrong HD. Check it out free for two months, just in time for football, hockey, and the baseball playoffs. Armstrong HD has the best picture quality available. See your favorite sports channels like never before, including NFL Red Zone, the Golf Channel, ESPN, NBC Sports, and more. Call today and add Armstrong HD and HD Advantage free for two months. Armstrong, one wire, infinite possibilities. There are a lot of misconceptions about counseling. The professionals at Rural Mental Health Associates want to set the record straight. Depression is a real illness and carries with it a high cost in terms of relationship problems, family suffering, and diminished work and school performance. Like adults, children experience stress in their lives. Often they act out what's bothering them. Counseling can teach coping skills. For more information, contact Rural Mental Health Associates today. Donovan and Bauer Auto Group is your home for Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. Our lot is filled with new and pre-owned vehicles, and if it's not on the lot, Ronnie the Ram will make sure the staff can find it. At Donovan and Bauer Chrysler, you can expect to find service after the sale with maintenance from their service department and their on-location collision center. Visit us online at www.donovanbauerautogroup.com to find your next Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, or Ram, or other pre-owned vehicles. Donovan and Bauer Auto Group on the Hightown Road, Titusville. For over 110 years, Farmers National Bank has been committed to the communities we serve. And being a part of the Titusville community, that commitment has grown stronger. We at Farmers strive to be and do more for our customers and our communities by offering competitive products and local decision-making capabilities. We invite you to visit our Titusville office and speak with branch manager John Danzer and regional manager Lance Titus regarding all of your banking needs. Come home to Farmers National Bank. Welcome back, everyone. This is To The Point. My name is Mark Heim. With me tonight is Dr. Chris Reber. Uh, Chris is the Executive Dean at Venango College. We've been talking about partnerships and collaboration in the academic side Mm -hmm. of the college's uh, life. 
but the college has also become a very good neighbor to the community mm -hmm. and that collaborative effort has borne a lot of fruit uh, probably one of the most visible signs of that has been the rehabilitation of the West End Park. Yeah, the pond. Right. Yes. What a what a labor of love that was. We, uh, as many of you know, um, back in the '90s, I think around 1996, that pond. Which, by the way, if I had a nickel for every person that told me uh, how how fond they were of growing up, fishing <laughs> in that pond, skating in the in the winter time, having wedding pictures taken there, I mean, it has been a community asset for years. It was man-made, but it's over 100 years old, mm. and. So in around 96, there was a 100-year flood that came through, completely filled the pond with silt. And in the process, uh, it washed out a uh, essentially a bridge that, mm -hmm. that went over it. And uh, so for a number of years, the university had this basically swamp. Mm. And uh, when I first arrived, which is hard to believe it's almost 11 years ago, I was immediately struck by the beauty of this. Well, the first thing that you see when you approach the campus and uh, it became for me a real kind of interest in you know, can, how can we rehabilitate it. Well, the cost was astronomical, and not, not only the need to dredge it, but really restore it, not only restore it to where it, its grandeur of one time, but try to make it uh, better than ever. Mm -hmm. So we wound up working with uh, community folks, environmentalists, just good citizens, uh, people that had grown up by the pond, put committees together to uh, create a vision for what we would do there. Uh, we wound up getting some grant funding and uh, hired an architect to do a feasibility study. All of that was accomplished and uh, the price tag was determined and it was several hundred thousand dollars. We raised that money and we were ready to go to construction and found out at the 11th hour that uh, that technically this pond, because of the way PennDOT fixed the, the bridge when it was washed out, technically now it is considered to be a dam. And uh, we've had many jokes about how you spell dam in this process. <laughs> but it's a dam, and dams, I may not be doing total justice to this, but dams need to be, uh, need to be, there are certain levels of things that you need to do when you're going to renovate or uh, do anything to a dam. So uh, we had to go back and re-engineer the whole thing because we. one of the requirements was anything you did had to be able to sustain a 100-year mm -hmm. flood. So uh, years were added to the process. We went back, new architects, raised money to get uh, more studies done. Now the price tag was over a million dollars. And, uh, and, and that included not only uh, the physical requirements, but we wanted to have a lighted pathway around the pond. We wanted to have a new handicap accessible uh, way to get from the campus uh, on a hillside mm -hmm. down to the pond, a picnic pavilion, a fire pit. We wanted to design it so that it could be used by the community, mm -hmm. uh, which was really what was so special about it. So the, the fine, in the final analysis, in the meantime, we hired – one of the things that I really take pride in is over the years when we've had the opportunity to hire people, we, uh, we've – we've been able to get some of the really great talent in the community. Now, this is a double-edged sword. Uh, it's created some, it, um, you know, some good-natured um, um, criticism because we've taken people from other uh, parts of the community. But one of the treasures that we were able to hire was Debbie Sabina, whom you well know, uh, who'd been very much involved in the banking community, who, who's a uh, Clarion product. She earned her bachelor's and, and MBA at Clarion. Debbie took on, she's our director of finance and administration. She wound up taking on really ownership of this whole arduous process of working with DEP and uh, contractors and architects. And so we finally began to call Debbie Sabina our Ponzarina. <laughs> and anyway, years later, we, we wound up raising the one, raised about a million dollars. University contributed about 200000 and uh, and it happened. But like so many things we've done, it's, it happened because the community really helped us, not only financially, but in terms of expertise and support. There was. I, I do recall that there was a lot of community support. Now, the college has been involved not only in things like that, uh, but I remember uh, as Royal City was pulling together the Weed and Seed program, yes. um, 
you and many others from the college were uh, involved in that. What kind of community involvement did that involve? That's very much a different kind of collaborative effort. Uh, we got we had a lot of students involved. We had our criminal justice club involved. Uh, faculty that uh, that did workshops for high school kids. It just had it took many different dimensions, and uh, and you're right, and it and it was something that and you know hopefully this this will continue. And uh, there was a setback in terms of funding, but I believe that the concept is really strong. But really, the idea of uh, not only uh, not only really having a focused uh, commitment to crime eradication, but a commitment to doing the kinds of things that keep people from getting involved right. in crime. And it was that piece in particular uh, that you, we were really able to play a role in bringing young people onto the campus for various activities. Um, after school tutoring, a whole variety of things. One of the things I'd like to revisit here for just a moment, um, along the same lines as the, as the construction of the West End Pond, the appearance of the community or the college has changed over time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been important too in attracting people. Uh, the campus has continually become a more handsome place to visit. Um, Road Center has been mm -hmm. renovated and improved, mm -hmm. and um, there are more apartment complexes and such, mm -hmm. and I believe there are more planned. Yes. Can you talk about those projects? Absolutely, and it, that's, it's a constant work in progress. Uh, it's, it's like good writing, I think. You know, the facilities, you never reach perfection, but you keep striving. <laughs> uh, th again, it's, it's ultimately everything we've been able to accomplish has been the result of a town gown partnership. So in the case of uh, the apartments, um, as we were developing new, some of the programs that we talked about that meet priority workforce needs, it became clear that uh, we could be recruiting not only students from the, this local community but from out of the area. And the extent to which we could recruit students from out of the area, uh, that had a lot to do with our ability to grow our enrollment, which then provided the opportunity to have more financial mm -hmm. resources that would allow us to do still more things. So we talked about, um, and this was really uh, a conversation with the community, the, uh, the efficacy of developing an apartment complex that would allow us to recruit students from out of town who wouldn't come to us mm -hmm. otherwise. And you well know, many years ago, there was, uh, Montgomery Hall was a, a privately owned residence mm -hmm. hall, and by all accounts, it was Animal House. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it just, it was, uh, this is years ago, but lots of damage. Students, at that time, again, students were second choice students. Mm -hmm. They didn't really want to, you know, they weren't choosing Venango campus as their uh, first choice. And it was just a bad experience. So ultimately, the university acquired that building through a tax sale, totally renovated it, and it's become now a really wonderful academic mm -hmm. uh, facility. But as we were looking at now building apartments adjacent to campus, so many folks remembered that bad experience. And so there, I must say there were some naysayers that mm. thought, you know, you're just not going to, you're going to have the same problem. You're going to build apartments and you're going to have uh, damage. And, and for that matter, can you really expect to fill apartments? And, uh, you know, these are really nice facilities. Yeah, they are. Um, but... Folks in the community saw the need. They they, they saw this as a, kind of an engine to the campus's mm -hmm. further growth, which was in the you know, the community's interest. And so, every one of those five buildings uh, was paid for fully through benefaction. So we mm -hmm. had community donors that provided the funding to build them. We only build the buildings when all of the cash is in hand. Mm -hmm. So there's no. Um, there's no mortgage, there's no bond issue, there's no debt. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we have been able to raise the money, we've added facilities. And I can tell you, we've done three three uh, groups of these. The first two opened in 2004. Mm -hmm. The third three-story building opened in 2006. The last two buildings opened in 2009. We're now in a campaign to raise funding for two more. These buildings are fully occupied with a waiting list. And the students have been unbelievably respectful of the facilities. In fact, our Clarion colleagues often marvel at the end of the academic year how respectful students have been. I mean, the normal kinds of damages you would expect aren't there. Mm. Uh, and beyond that, students have there's been a community that, of students there that uh, it's close-knit, it's friendly, 
it's added a whole new dimension to the campus. These residential students have really pushed the envelope in terms of mm -hmm. additional services and um, um, office hours and things like that, student clubs and organizations. So it's just been a dynamic, uh, had a dynamic impact. It's been 100% successful. Uh, we started this year something that I think is very exciting. It's called Living Learning Communities. Mm. And so we've given students in the apartments who are majoring in nursing or allied health the opportunity, if they choose, to live together with other students with the same major. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a program that, that faculty lead. They live together, but there is a uh, an ongoing kind of a, a, a program of out-of-class activities, field trips in areas of career interest, alumni coming back, talking about their occupations, study uh, group sessions, uh, speakers. Uh, uh, and we have 35 students involved in that program this year. Very, very successful. I think that's going to, it's really what we would call a high impact educational mm. practice where students are getting uh, uh, much more than, than just the traditional, and I shouldn't say just, the traditional ex college experience, but as Emerald would say, kicked up a notch. <laughs> uh, it's, um, that's the kind of thing we want to do more and more of. So those apartments, they're all named for the donors who made them mm -hmm. possible. We need two more. And our uh, the price tag there is 2.2 million. We are uh, on our way to, to building two more of those. And the pond came to be in the same way. You mentioned the Rhodes uh, Student Center mm -hmm. renovation. That I think is a particularly inspirational story. That building was built in 1976. It's the it's really the living room of the campus mm -hmm. for students. Uh, it needed a facelift. We had outgrown it, and. Uh, we worked with our students. Students were really advocating, you know, expanding it, and they wanted a they wanted an athletic exercise facility, uh, more conference rooms, a uh, cyber cafe, and so one of our university partners, Harry Tripp, who's vice president for student and university affairs, was able to bring us some funds that he had in his auxiliary account. Uh, uh, funds that uh, accrued through student fees mm. at the Clarion campus loaned us, oh, I can't remember, $1.4 million, something like that. But he, he couldn't give it to us, mm -hmm. but he could loan it to us. And students chose to uh, double a fee that they were paying called the Venango Student Support Fee that was used to provide and still is services outside mm. the classroom. They chose to more than double it in order to provide a new funding source to pay off the amortization. Wow. So in the case of that building renovation, students were the donors and and really chose to to pay in order to make it happen. It sounds like they've really taken ownership of yes. many things. Students are, uh, it's you know, my entire career, which is getting to be longer than I'd like to admit, <laughs> uh, has been in higher education. And I've worked for a number of fine institutions. This has been the most meaningful experience of my career. And a big part of it is the students. Uh, what's so wonderful about our students uh, is the vast majority are first-generation college students. Their parents didn't go to college. Uh, and they're ex uh, generally speaking, they are exceedingly grateful and proud uh, of what they're accomplishing. And so are their families, by the way. Uh, and they're very uh, good, genuine people. They're also largely coming from modest backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, characteristic of our community. These are not uh, students from highly affluent backgrounds. They're not necessarily particularly well-traveled, but they're eager to learn. They're very capable, and I believe strongly that the experience they're getting is life-changing. I can see that, especially in the graduation ceremonies that yes. I've covered. Yes. Uh, all of these students are particularly proud of what they do, and their families enormously proud. Absolutely. You can tell. Uh, and those graduation ceremonies, I'm sure, are things that they remember for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. When we come back from our next break, I would like to talk to you uh, some more, um, maybe about, uh, I guess you might call them some personal affairs. Uh, what brought you here to Venango mm -hmm. County? Uh, and I know that you have an interest in media and radio. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, well, we'll explore all those things when we come back in just a few minutes. Titusville Chiropractor Adam Middleton welcomes you to the Titusville office of Middleton Chiropractic. 
Dr. Middleton is committed to improving the function of your nervous system so that you can have a higher quality of life. Through their office, you'll receive the best care through the use of modern chiropractic techniques and technology. Call us today and we can develop a chiropractic plan specific for you. 827-9970. Or visit our website for more information. Middleton Chiropractic. Your chiropractor in Titusville. Country Acres Personal Care Home provides their residents with the care that they have come to deserve. The caring staff attends to the needs of its residents, and the home provides spacious rooms and bathrooms. And now Country Acres offers adult day care for those loved ones that need a little care during the day, while also providing respite care. For more information on Country Acres Personal Care Home, please call 827-3708 or visit them just past the airport on Route 27. Country Acres Personal Care Home. Wishing Alyssa, Titusville, and Maplewood the best of luck this sports season. Colonial Machine Company in Pleasantville is a proud supporter of the Titusville Rockets. The Colonial Machine Company takes pride in their products, working hard to manufacture and supply a quality product that's priced right and made right here in the USA. The Colonial Machine Company would like to wish the Rocket athletes best of luck on and off the field and remind you that you are a product of your school and the community. So continue to work hard, play hard, and maintain the quality of excellence that Rocket fans have come to expect. Go Rockets from the Colonial Machine Company in Pleasantville. Donovan and Bauer Auto Group is your GM home for Chevy, Buick, and GMC vehicles. Our lot is filled with new and pre-owned vehicles, and if we don't have it, we'll find it. Our staff will help you through the entire process, and we're here after the sale with our service department and collision center. Visit us online at www.donovanbauer.com to find your next vehicle, or stop in and talk to the pros at Donovan and Bauer Auto Group on the Hightown Road in Titusville. It's time to head outdoors and take care of that yard work. And at Morrison's in Titusville, they're ready to help. Whether it's rakes, shovels, wheelbarrows, or decorative stones and backyard accessories, you'll find the supplies and the experience at Morrison's. And at Morrison's, too, you'll find guns, ammo, clothing, and other accessories in stock. Plus, Jim has one of the area's largest supplies of musket and muzzle-loading gear. Morrison's and Morrison's, too, on West Central Avenue in Titusville. Hi, this is Chris Feely, proprietor of the Lunchbox Deli at 115 West Central Avenue. I wear many shirts in the community, but the one that I'm most proud of is the brown and gold. Through hard work and dedication, our student athletes learn commitment, leadership, and communications. So I ask you, as a fan of the brown and gold, to go out and support our Rockets, whether it's on the course, on the court, or in the field. And above all, go Rockets! Welcome back, everyone, to the third and final part of To the Point. My name is Mark Heim. With me is Dr. Chris Reber, the Executive Dean at Venango College in Oil City. Uh, We've been talking about the collaborative effort, both in academics and in the appearance of the campus. Uh, Maybe on to some lighter things here. Um, If I remember correctly, you didn't necessarily have to choose to come to this area. This is something that you... uh, took a good long look mm-hmm. at and decided that it was for the good. I I have been so fortunate in my own career to have wound up in places that had uh, vision, integrity, and strong leadership. Most of my experience before I got here was at Penn State Erie, the Barron College, mm-hmm. Penn State Barron, and uh, I wound up there very serendipitously right out of a master's degree program back in 1981. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had never been to Erie. I grew up in York, PA, near Harrisburg. And uh, at that time, Barron Campus, there are a lot of parallels with mm-hmm. Venango Campus. Barron had been an underachieving part of Penn State. And uh, it was a place where, for many years, students who wanted to get to Happy Valley, were, they were sent to Barron mm-hmm. instead. And uh, they hired a dynamic leader the year before I got there, Dr. John Lilly, who wound up becoming a real mentor and inspiration for me. John had a vision, and his vision was Barron needed to do a few things well, things that mattered for the community, needed to partner with community agencies. Uh, You're going to start to hear similarities. So they developed over the years what is now a nationally distinctive plastics engineering technology program. Plastics is an important industry in Erie. Mm -hmm. Uh, They developed the plastics industry saying, we can't hire the people we need. Will you work with us? 
Um, and in fact, the story is they approached some of the comp competing institutions that turned them down, got to Barron. John said, sure, we'll work with you. Over the years, they developed a four-year program that has become a national model, raised the money to develop high-tech uh, facilities like a plastics lab that's really stellar. Uh, that program, for a number of years, graduated students with the highest starting salaries in all of Penn State. Wow. Uh, and so Barron gradually, John had a vision that this was going to be a place that uh, was that students would choose to do a Penn State education, small college with a big degree, a few programs that, uh, that are distinctive and not repeating, uh, repeating what's done at University Park, and a place that would grow because the community, it would partner with the community and the community would invest in it. Uh, at, for a long time, I remember, and I, I was a brand new professional, and I'm hearing this dynamic man talk about these ideas. Well, I remember in the early years, people saying, oh, that's John. You know, John was talking about developing a knowledge park where you would actually develop R&D facilities and get students and faculty involved in helping area industry. Fast forward, uh, all that has come to be because he had a vision. He worked with the community. The com I think over the years, the community donated $100 million to Behrend. Um, so he was my mentor, and I was doing, I, for a long time, I was the dean of students there. Mm -hmm. And then one day he floored me. They were in a capital campaign, a $50 million campaign. He asked me if I would move into the uh, vice president for advancement role and oversee the campaign. I said, I've never, re I've never asked anybody for money. Uh, but he said, you know, it's not about that. It's about uh, being able to... Um, communicate a vision and work with me. He taught me how to do all of that. And uh, so I had grown with Behrend, um, and Behrend had grown. And uh, I, I was getting to a point in my career where if I wanted to do something new, maybe move into a, a, a leadership role, it was kind of time to move, move mm -hmm. on. Well, along came a, a friend who said, you should see what they're doing down at Venango campus of Clarion University. They had a vision that sounded a lot like Behrend. Uh, they wanted to really uh, develop Venango as a center of excellence, doing a few things well, things that matter for the community. I mean, it was the very same right. blueprint. It intrigued me. I wanted to stay in the region. That's how I got here. Mm. And we are nothing. We are very different from Behrend in many ways, including size. But we have the same common basic uh, uh, elements that mm -hmm. have led to our success. It sounds like both campuses have become an academic destination, if you will. Yes, that's exactly correct. And Barron, by the way, was a center before it became a campus, before it became a college. And when we were investigating, when we were exploring becoming Clarion's fourth academic college, Barron became a uh, one of two uh, case studies that we really looked at. The other was uh, Penn College of Technology, mm -hmm. formerly Williamsport Area Community College. Both basically uh, noted that when they became colleges within a university, uh, it was transformational in terms of the institution's ability to move on and uh, move to the next level. Now, I imagine that as you grew and developed in your career, your outlook and philosophy on education also grew and changed as well. Yes. I, uh, I've, always, I've always valued the small college experience. I had, that was my undergraduate experience. Mm -hmm. I went to Dickinson College, about 1,600 students at the time in Carlisle, PA. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and I've gone to larger institutions as well, but I really believe, uh, finally, uh, a student's ability to, to succeed is, a, is largely about fit, and small works mm -hmm. for some and large works for others. But I think, uh, in a lot of ways, small is the most can be the most inspirational. In terms of my own philosophy, I, I majored in Latin as an undergraduate. Um, people say, really? But uh, it was because we had great faculty and uh, never regretted it. It was a wonderful, rich education. I love when I can use my Latin. Uh, Luke will test you out on that after <laughs> is that the program. Right? Education. Ecce in victora es puella nomine Cornelia. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. I'm I'm really inspired. But education really means it it means to draw out, to bring out that which is inherently part of you. It's not about a faculty member uh, lecturing from on high and uh, and uh, transmitting wisdom. It's really about helping the individual develop his or her own innate um, strengths. It almost sounds like it's. 
I've heard the term pleasure-based education. If, if you're good at something, you should center there and everything else will grow yes. from that. I think much of it is discovery. It's helping students really uh, discover what, what their skill set, what their interests, what really do they feel passionate about? What really excites them? And I think often uh, it's the college experience, not just the courses, that help students discover that. Some know it from the very beginning. Uh, but what I think we view ourselves, and this is certainly my philosophy, and I think it really is the philosophy of my colleagues at Venango, we are partners with students. The faculty and staff are partners. We always say to students uh, at orientation, uh, we are, your success is our success. We're here because of you. And we want you to succeed. And the two times of the year that we most value are now, when you're new and we're getting to know you, and commencement, when we celebrate together your accomplishments. And uh, I think that's what it's about. I think, it's, I think inspiration is a key part of it. It's not just the content learning, but it's, it's having faculty that are demanding, that have high expectations, but are also very caring. Mm -hmm. And through their own personal example, uh, inspire students to want to do more and to, to become uh, excited about learning and to look for not just getting by but really excelling. It sounds like the old adage that if you demand a higher standard people will strive to Absolutely. meet it. Absolutely. That's excellent. Yeah. I would like to talk for the last few minutes about mm -hmm. something that has been a little bit of an inspiration to you possibly but uh, in past conversations, you have talked about your connection with uh, radio and media, and it sounds like you had a, a good time with that. I did. Well, it, back to my Baron days and John Lilly, my mentor, uh, I mean, he was always wanting to do new things. It was, he was the kind of person that was always like, let's do this. And you'd say, <laughs> John, how can we do that? <laughs> so one day I got a call from, this is when I was dean of students. He said, I just got this interesting call. Uh, there's an AM radio station, AM 1450 in Erie, that was moving to a higher frequency. A they were moving to 1330 on the dial. And by FCC regulation, at least at that time, you couldn't just abandon mm -hmm. your place on the uh, dial. You had to find another occupant for it. And they decided they wanted to give this station to Behrend. I think partly because we were less likely to become competitors. <laughs> uh, but he basically said to me, Chris, will you take over getting this station up? It has to be up and running in three months, and uh, will you be responsible for it? I had never had a day of experience <laughs> with radio. I knew nothing about radio. And uh, the way we made it happen was, of course, getting people involved in the community. There was a wonderful gentleman named Myron Jones. I don't know if you know him, but he owned uh, a number of TV and radio stations in Erie, branched out into Youngstown, self-made, one of the most inspirational people I've ever met, came and helped us, and others did. And so we wound up building a station, getting a um, satellite dish, figuring out what, our, what were we going to do on the air. Well, the really distinctive thing was we had a commercial license, and universities never have commercial yeah. licenses. We did. And so uh, we had the ability to sell commercials. We wound up hiring a really I interesting uh, manager. We wound up uh, doing what I called rotary on the air. We uh, interviewed businesses in Erie, and they became what we called educational partners. They would, uh, they would pay to become a WPSE, Penn State Erie, partner. And in exchange for that, we interviewed them about their business. Well, this started to become a who's who. Everyone wanted to hear their own interview and other interviews, and it was CEOs from all over the community. We then got CBS News and Sports, which was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And then got some, for, we had some other feed for a while. It was Business Radio Network. But we were basically News Talk Sports with a commercial license. And this rather distinctive uh, format actually allowed the station to become self-supporting. Wow. And uh, it, was, it, it exists today. So if you're in Erie, tune into 1450. And check that out. Yeah. That's pretty neat. That's something we'll have to check out yeah. maybe and we can try it here on, on our own. Mm -hmm. Well, we have had an absolutely marvelous hour together. Uh, we have talked about a number of things, the academic achievements, the growth, uh, the appearance of the campus and the way that's changed, uh, how you've been such a, a, a wonderful good neighbor to the community, not only in Venango County, but in areas beyond and things like that. And we've explored uh, how if uh, instructors 
demand a, a higher standard, students will strive to meet it and how, how that has worked for you. Um, any other success stories? Anything you want to uh, well, throw I'll just out say, before you leave? Same thing, just like the radio station, uh, there was a need for a child care center. John Lilly calls me. Will you, will you get a center started and be responsible for it? <laughs> I didn't have children. Uh, that we lost a hundred thousand dollars in the first year, but today that center is nationally accredited and it's very successful. He taught me that you can do all kinds of things when you get other people involved and you have a vision. That's the one thing I think I have learned since I moved back here to the area in 2004. I think the first word I learned here uh, in my Venango County vocabulary was collaboration. Yes. And that it works in just about any kind of environment, not only in the education environment, but when it comes to areas of social service and social concern, uh, when it comes to areas of governmental cooperation and what have you. Right. Um, it seems that there is strength in numbers and a great deal of talent in numbers. Uh, so I think if there's anything that we've learned or anything that we've really discussed throughout this hour, is the success story of collaboration. Would you agree? Absolutely, Mark. And uh, congratulations to you and the stream. Uh, I think this is an exciting venture. Well, as I've told other people, I've gotten back into doing something that I always found out that I always wanted to do. And here we are. Here you are, uh, back on uh, a media outlet here. This is a netcasting outlet, so mm -hmm. I imagine this is a brand new process yes, for you, too. Yes, you bet. So. At any rate, we want to thank all of our uh, viewers and listeners for joining us tonight, uh, listening to a conversation with Dr. Chris Reber, uh, the uh, Executive Dean at Fenango College, and listening to the success story of this wonderful uh, institution of learning in Venango County and a gem to the community. Uh, on behalf of the staff uh, here at the stream, I would like to uh, thank everyone for listening, and we hope that you will be here next week when we have uh, another community guest in to uh, explore uh, issues with it as well. Thank you, everyone. Good night, and thank you for watching. another hour of the greatest hits of all time and the most information on Titusville and the oil region. We are TitusvillePALive.com and OilRegionLive.com. The stream. Today I don't feel